Well, at least the coalition is a, a cohesive team. It would appear it was on Senate voting reform, uh, and it seems mm -hmm. to have brought the Greens alongside. We've seen this morning uh, confirmation from the Australian Labor Party they'll not be supporting uh, these uh, proposed changes to Senate voting reform. I know you've talked a fair bit about this with Tom Connell, but it might be worth just uh, to refresh what Senator Sam Dastiari uh, has been arguing and seems to have prevailed uh, within the Labor caucus. Senate voting reform proposals that would be about numbering one to six above the line are a complete and utter rort. What the government doesn't like the makeup of the Senate and what they're trying to do is a backroom deal with the Greens to change the rules. That is not the way we do things in this country. That is not what reform should look like. Laura, we're going to now go and talk to Senator David Lionhelm, New South Wales Senator uh, representing the Liberal Democratic Party. Uh, let's bring him in, Senator Lionhelm. Uh, we hear there uh, Senator Dastiari arguing quite strongly against the uh, proposed voting reforms, calling it a, ro a rort. Uh, and he's also said that it's Senate reform designed to defeat political opponents. Uh, you're uh, probably right there in the government crosshairs. Uh, you're, uh, I know you're opposed to these Senate voting reforms, um, but uh, you, how are you going to express that on the floor of the parliament? Uh, particularly when it comes to contentious legislation like the ABCC? Well, um, I'm not sure that uh, I'll change a great deal. I've, I've tended to give the government the benefit of the doubt when uh, my libertarian principles, my party's principles, are, um, are not uh, fundamental to a decision. So lots of legislation comes through that it, it doesn't really make much difference to liberty or increase taxes or reduce taxes or anything like that. And they're the main criteria by which I judge legislation. So, but I've tended to give the government, of the, uh, give, give the, government the, the benefit of the doubt, and that's reflected in my voting record, which is about 70% in favour of the government. Now, um, I don't have to do that. I don't have to give them the, gov uh, the benefit of the doubt. There's also, even on legislation where there is a principle involved, I've tended to say, well, look, if it's, even if it's only a small step in the right direction, it's better than nothing, um, even though, you know, I, I think there's some fundamental flaws in what they're trying to do. Um, I, I've mm. been inclined to say, well, you know, you know give, them the, so, give them a nod. So I don't Senator, have to do that anymore either. Now you, so are you saying that you feel uh, a bit more free uh, to express your reservations and maybe withhold your vote in support of government legislation where in the past you may well have given it? I, I don't think there'll be a lot of uh, legislation that's contested coming up between now and the election, to be frank. I expect there'll be a double dissolution in uh, July. We've got uh, three more sitting weeks. Uh, we probably what, what have we got? One week in the budget week. And uh, that's it. Well, the government. Um, sorry, and, uh, I just want to ask you. The government seems to still be suggesting they're going to push forward as fast as they can with the ABCC legislation. Clearly, they'd like to have mm, something yeah. like that—that that iconic type legislation for a double dissolution. Uh, so it mm -hmm. sounds like you are uh, less inclined to give them support. You were one of the few that were was out there <laughs> suggesting you would support it. Yeah, my support was pretty conditional, and this this kind of falls into the category of. Well, you know, they, I give them the benefit of the doubt. They went to the election on it, um, and uh, you know, it is it is pretty important to them. So I was inclined to say, even though it offends some of my liberal principles, it's got a reverse onus of proof uh, component to it. There's a um, abolition of the right to silence component in it, both of which offend me a great deal. I took the view, mm. well, if I get a, a sunset clause of eight years on it, you know, I'll let it go through. Now, you know, they say, thanks very much, we're going to put you out of business. Um, I'm re reconsidering my position. David Lionhelm, Laura Jays here. Can I ask you uh, about your relationship with the government at the moment? I know uh, when Malcolm Turnbull took over as Prime Minister, you were uh, quite buoyed at the time about uh, the renegotiation and the way that he was dealing with the backbench. Are you still positive about that or does, you know, the attempt to, as you put it, put you out of business change all of that? Yes, it's changed everything, uh, um, quite frankly. Um, we were devastated yesterday. We had been led to believe that uh, this sort of thing wouldn't happen. Um, I can't say the government ever outright lied to us, but certainly allowed us to get the impression that 
they would never do this sort of thing, but a deer with the greens, their mortal enemy, the greens, would, uh, would never be considered. And especially um, to put out the minor parties and get rid of the minor parties when they've got legislation through the Senate with the support of the minor parties and they gave every impression of uh, thinking well, of, of saying well, at least for myself, Bob Day and D.O. Wang, they'd never do anything to get rid of us because they thought we were valuable. Um, they were very frustrated with, uh, with Jackie Lambie and Glenn Lazarus in particular, but I never thought they would eliminate all of us, uh, you know, just to, to uh, deal with those two in particular. Mm. So it was a surprise. It has changed my outlook on life. It certainly changed Bob Day's outlook on life. He's, um, he suddenly realised that politics is uh, no, uh, no place for friendliness. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, we really are, both of us, really reconsidering our position. Well, David Lionhelm, The Guardian is reporting that the uh, Prime Minister has invited the crossbench to the lodge on Thursday night for dinner. Uh, first of all, did you get an invitation? And secondly, what do you reckon the mood around the table might be? Well, yes, I got an invitation. I accepted the invitation. Uh, so did apparently all of the crossbench, although I think uh, the invitation to Ricky Moore, he was telling us earlier today in our crossbench meeting, he didn't, doesn't remember receiving his, his so perhaps it got lost somewhere. Um, there is a discussion about whether we'll even go. Um, uh, I know a couple of uh, senators, uh, crossbench senators, have either pulled out or are seriously considering pulling out. We had a discussion about that this morning, and uh, it's, I think it's a uh, work in progress. There's no final decision. I think, my, if, it was, if I had to decide right now, I'd probably say I was going, but uh, uh, it might change. David Lionhelm, what is it in your disposal now? What power do you have to change this? Uh, and, you know, when you say you're reconsidering everything, are you reconsidering your uh, future in politics? Uh, do you feel like you've had a win with uh, not having to uh, change your name uh, of the party at, at this stage? And I guess as a third part to my question as well, what do you say to the argument that, uh, you know, there was some confusion at the last election? It is hard to explain why you got such a big... Uh, a primary vote with Liberal in your name? Well, uh, the issue about our name is not over. The Liberal Party is still taking us and the Australian Electoral Commission to the um, uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That case will be heard in uh, Canberra next month. And we've hired uh, uh, some expensive lawyers and we're very optimistic that we'll actually win that case. Um, What's the future for me and my party? Uh, my personal future, I don't care. I mean, um, I can make more money outside Parliament than inside. What I want to do is make a difference, um, whether I do it or whether another person elected from my party uh, does it, is, is neither here nor there. I'll work just as hard to get my, um, my, our other uh, candidates from the Liberal Democratic Party elected as, I'm, as I will to get myself elected. We have some options, though. Um, first of all, I'm trying to persuade backbench Liberals and, and um, Liberal Party members that an alliance with the Greens is supping with the devil. I'm also trying mm. to convince National Party voters that this deal is not in their interests. They often talk about whether the coalition is voluntary. Could they walk away from the coalition and just work in a cooperative relationship with the um, with the Liberal Party. There's not a chance that that would ever be a realistic possibility under the proposed changes. They will be permanently on a joint ticket with the Libs. Um, the, other, um, the other things that we're talking about with the minor parties is running in the um, uh, marginal seats that the Coalition holds, the ones that they'd like to hold in the election, and preferencing away from the Coalition. We can do that if enough minor parties agree to do it. There is a minor party alliance meeting in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, th and the seat of Melbourne, where Adam Bant sits, and the Greens, of course, are part of this dirty little deal, um, we could also run in that seat in preference away from the Greens, and he'd likely lose his seat. So uh, those are the things. They're retaliation rather than reversing the change or undoing the change. So we're still discussing the merits of those. 
Can I go, though, to the uh, government's claim to why this reform is needed? Uh, they say it's hard for the voters' intention to be followed, given that there are these preference whispers and people doing, you know, behind the scenes or hard to understand uh, Byzantine type deals uh, to ensure that various people can get elected. Uh, you know, you received just under 1,600 votes, uh, where someone like Nick Xenophon received just under 25,000 votes, but yet each of your parties only got one senator up. Do you really think that's reflecting the voters' intentions? Do you think the current system is really allowing the voters' intentions to be reflected in the Senate that's elected? Uh, well, I got 450,000. I think you might have been referring to Ricky Muir and, and the number of votes he got. I got 450,000 in, um, in New South Wales, 9.5 per cent. But if Sorry, the, you're the, right. The I apologize. Voting system, yeah, the, the current voting system... Um, I'm not suggesting it's perfect and it can't be improved, but it has been in place for 30 years. It was 1984 it was introduced. We saw C. C. Fielding elected in Victoria in 2004 on 1.9% of the vote. Nobody said the system was broken then. John Madigan was elected in uh, when was it, 2010 with 2.3% of the vote. Again, uh, there was no suggestion the voting was uh, the system was broken. Then we get to 2013 and Ricky Muir gets elected on, what is it, less than half a percent. And all of a sudden, the system is broken. I got nine and a half percent. The pups got six, seven, nine, thirteen percent, something like that. Bob Day got three and a half percent of the vote. I mean, what's broken about here? One person gets elected in, in 2004, 2010, and 2013, who is a bit, you know, um, a, a small vote. Um, I don't see that there's a huge problem. Now, if you want to argue that it's still unfair, all this um, um, preference trading, then all we have to do is adopt the Victorian system. In, in Victoria, they have group voting tickets for the upper house. You vote one above the line. The group voting tickets get lodged. If your, if your preferred candidate doesn't get elected, your preferences go according to how the parties lodge this group voting ticket. But you can also vote below the line, and you only have to vote for as many candidates as there are places to be filled. You don't have to fill out mm. every box below the line. So if there's 100 candidates, you've got to go one to 100. That's what you have to do in the Senate. And they're not even going to change that. So, but if we adopted this, the, the Victorian voting system for the Senate, you could still have one above the line if you trusted the party to distribute your preferences. You could vote one to six below the line or more if you wanted to below mm. the line. And, uh, and then you would control where your preferences went. I don't see what's wrong with that. And it would solve this issue of, of people who worry that their preferences are going to go to a party they don't support. Well, David Lino, it seems that you would have a fair bit of lobbying ahead of you. Good luck with that and thanks for your time <laughs> on To The Point today. Okay, thank you.